I'm going to do something that may not be intuitively obvious. I'm going to connect kind of the story of Xbox to enterprise software and take on a little bit of a, of a journey. So we as human beings are you know, naturally uh, very curious, uh, and we also like to know uh, where we're going and, and what's ahead. And uh, we often, uh, as part of our, our daily lives, try to predict uh, the future and what's around the corner. And we do that using history and our own experiences. And sometimes that works, often it doesn't. And we make predictions and then there's what actually happens. How many of you know what this is a picture of? Okay, so a, f a few of you. Um, this is all of Microsoft in uh, 1978. So that's the entire company. Um, so fast forward uh, just uh, about 20 years uh, into the future. And um, at this point in time, uh, Microsoft's revenues are almost $20 billion, um, massively profitable uh, at around $8 billion. And even more impressive is that the company is still growing extremely quickly, 28% uh, uh, growth in FY98, 29% growth in FY99. One thing to keep in mind is that really the, the core of Microsoft's business was the enterprise. Uh, they were um, absolutely focused on uh, the desktop and uh, the enterprise software, and that uh, division was 17, almost uh, $18 billion. Th there was uh, you know, some, some business uh, in uh, the, the consumer space and, and devices, but it was really dwarfed at a mere $1.2 billion by, by the rest of the business. Um, so I was um, at the company at this time. I joined uh, in uh, 93 as a developer to work on the first version of Windows NT. So I was, uh, I was in the thick of it. A uh, handful of us got together. Uh, we were all in the Windows division. And, you know, we, Windows was the thing. It had won the contest to be the, you know, world's productivity platform. You know, the, 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 the race was over, the game was over, we had won. And, you know, it would have been easy to kind of, you know, just, you know, rest, rest on that success. But we started asking ourselves, look, there are only so many people on the planet, there are only so many desks on which you can put uh, a, a PC. You know, what's going to be, um, you know, the next big thing that we can do to uh, build our business. So we had one productivity. What about entertainment and specifically living room entertainment? And we started looking at that space and the incumbents at the time were Sony, Sega, and Nintendo. And it was really the Sony PlayStation platform that caught our, caught our eye because you know, they were uh, building uh, market share very rapidly, and it seemed like they had a real vision uh, for taking over an entire space uh, and, and potentially locking uh, us, Microsoft, um, out of that space. So at the time, uh, Microsoft did have a game console strategy. Unfortunately, you know, the, the handful of us uh, who were you know, taking a fresh look uh, felt that it wasn't the winning strategy. It, it tried to mimic the, the Windows business model, but it really wasn't working uh, for a number of uh, key reasons, uh, not the least of which is that it was a partnership model where we had limited control over the content creation pipeline itself. And it didn't help that the core technology uh, that we were trying to, to use uh, to provide to the uh, content creators just wasn't a very good fit for high quality interactive entertainment that was based on the Windows CE platform, which really was uh, Windows and brand name only. And it didn't have uh, a lot of the attributes that 
we felt uh, could be uh, really redeployed well um, in, a, in a different way. The uh, other thing that was, uh, you know, very present in, in our minds was that um, the other players were all very hardware-centric. Um, Sega, Nintendo, they, they really thought of themselves as hardware vendors, as consumer electronics vendors. And when you looked at, you know, content development, actually building great experiences, uh, you know, they, they, they weren't great at activating uh, the developer ecosystem. Um, so we said, look, you know, why don't we take a different approach that uh, p places the content at the, at the heart of the equation and places uh, the customer experience at the heart of the equation and make it as easy as possible to build the best content possible. So we took a step back and said, look, what are, what are the Windows assets that we can really uh, take advantage of? And I was a little bit biased because I was running the DirectX graphics uh, team uh, at the time. But, you know, we were, you know, in the Windows division, we knew one or two things about uh, operating systems, so we had that in our in our pocket. We also had, as I mentioned, uh, DirectX graphics technology, and um, along with that, uh, a real developer ecosystem and more of a software-driven uh, approach to, to uh, uh, enabling uh, great content development. And in fact, we had built because of these assets a really vibrant developer ecosystem. Um, around the PC, and importantly, uh, in the process of building this, uh, this, this graphics technology, we had engaged deeply uh, with hardware vendors, uh, of course, uh, Intel uh, being the, the Wintel platform, but uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, the uh, emerging uh, graphics hardware technology vendors like um, NVIDIA and ATI. At the end of the day, a game console is a visualization platform. So if you can uh, build uh, you know, something that is really essentially geared for high quality visualization, you could have something that was truly unique. So we assembled these components and we said, look, why don't we, why don't we synthesize some of these elements in a form that was appropriate for living room uh, experience? And, um, you know, the concept was really repackaging, uh, you know, uh, these assets uh, as a, essentially a direct Xbox, a visualization platform for the living room that had uh, a direct X uh, GPU, um, de developer friendly uh, environment uh, to build great content, um, the Windows derived operating system uh, to um, really provide some of the, uh, some, of, some of those core assets and using the PC architecture. We didn't want to reinvent wheels. We didn't want to do custom, a whole bunch of custom uh, hardware development. We could just take advantage of uh, our, our expertise with the PC and redeploy it. So um, it really was uh, a simplified uh, version uh, of a personal computer and with a user experience and a delivery vehicle that, that was appropriate uh, for the living room. So we were, um, this was the, the Wall Street Journal article that, that broke the story. So there were four of us who uh, were the original founders of, uh, of the Xbox. It, it makes a great story to call us renegades, uh, but really we were just applying uh, you know, a, a different kind of thinking and approach uh, to the problem and, and to the opportunity uh, in the living room. One of the key decisions, and it was a tough one, a contentious one, uh, was whether to do something that was a, a little bit, um, you know, out of the mainstream of, of game consoles or to go head-to-head -head, uh, with the competition uh, directly. And part of the reason this was a challenging decision is because the game console market traditionally was uh, razor razor blades, meaning that you sold the console at a loss but you made it up um, over the course of the um, console's generation lifetime through hardware cost reductions and also through uh, licenses and, and, and content sales. Um, so, you know, going head to head 
with the existing councils would be a very, very costly proposition. But ultimately, we decided, look, you know, we, we, we can't handicap ourselves if the, the, the goal uh, is to take market share and, and become uh, a leading brand in the living room at scale and at volume. And uh, so we made the big bet. The initial funding round, essentially, internally, and this is you know, all internal to Microsoft, the, the initial green light funding was a billion dollars. And that was just, you know, here's a billion dollars, go start spending it as fast as you can, because it's going to take billions of dollars to get into this market successfully. <laughs> There was no pro forma, there was no you know, ROI calculation, nothing. It was just, we knew it, was, it had to be a, a, a big number. So it was, uh, it was certainly a, a, a big, bold bet. And this is the uh, first product that was on, on the market. Uh, the next generation was, uh, was the 360, so launched in uh, 2001 which was a, a pretty fast cycle time since the, uh, the decision to, to go for it was uh, in the um, you know, second half of 1999. So, um, you know, we really did uh, move incredibly quickly to get something out on the market and start building uh, our presence. So, one of the things that was a key differentiator in addition to uh, you know, an incredibly, um, you know, vibrant, vibrant developer ecosystem um, and, uh, you know, great underlying um, hardware technology was the fact that, and, and the, the concept from, from day one was to have a connected platform. Um, back in, you know, the, the, this era, the, you know, the, the ubiquitousness of, of the internet was, was, was yet to be. But we, you know, we felt strongly that the internet would play, you know, an incredibly important future role in the platform. Uh, the very first Xbox had, you know, an Ethernet port in the back, and subsequent uh, versions would uh, increasingly incorporate um, both wired and wireless technology in, into the platform. And a couple of years um, after. The initial launch, uh, Xbox Live uh, came came on the scene once uh, you know, there was enough internet build out, infrastructure build out, uh, to actually make um, that uh, functionality uh, viable. And you know, this this was really a tipping point um, for the platform because you went from a disconnected uh, experience, you know, playing a game by yourself, and that was all well and good, to now actually being able to connect uh, with, with other players globally um, and, and engage uh, digitally with, with other, other uh, players playing games. And the vision for Xbox uh, wasn't that, it wasn't j just around uh, playing games, it was um, all up uh, entertainment. And a few short years um, after um, uh, the um, Xbox Live uh, came on the scene, um, we started seeing uh, more, uh, more applications of uh, online, online usage. So, and this is where, you know, the story shifts to presaging, you know, some of the massive changes that, would, um, that were, would start happening and would start happening at scale in the enterprise. You started having pervasive internet. You started having customer expectations change to assume an online connected digital first experience uh, with a brand, which ultimately led to the digital disruption of businesses. Netflix is a great example, and uh, one of the uh, first uh, super popular um, uh, Netflix apps was on uh, Xbox. Uh, it was on the Xbox 360, and um, you know, it was uh, um, you know, a, a fantastic uh, success, and it would uh, presage what would happen with the digital transformation of media. Uh, which was my next chapter. Um, so, 
uh, you know, back uh, back in um, you know, the mid mid two thousands, um, even the, the second half of two um, thousands, the core Netflix business model was still around shipping DVDs in red envelopes. But um, you could squint, and and you know, the popularity of of the Netflix app on on Xbox was a was a good proxy for uh, what was to come, and. Um, I got a call, uh, you know, 2010, uh, from a Time Warner uh, recruiter. I'm like, mm, that's that's interesting. I'm not sure why they're calling me. As it turns out, uh, Time Warner, um, uh, and I give them a ton of credit for this. They they recognized early on uh, the digital transformation that would ultimately take place in uh, in media. And um, you know they uh, recognized that this was a whole different, uh, whole different animal, and that they needed uh, to take a different approach with uh, with different expertise to be able to navigate uh, to where the landscape uh, was shifting. And um, I joined um, HBO, among other things. It wasn't the only thing that I did, but among other things too. Um, and really, my my key focus was building out. Uh, HBO's uh, digital streaming uh, capabilities. Now, up until that job, um, I had always worked at technology companies, and you know, you 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 get blind uh, when when you work in in just one area of industry. And um, I had worked at at Microsoft. I'd worked at, work worked at um, Autodesk uh, before then, and. You know, you just walk down the, the, the hallway to find, you know, some great developers. You, find, you walk down a different hallway to find some great um, UI, UX, uh, you know, designers, um, you know, DevOps folks, uh, people who understood um, large-scale cloud computing and, you know, enter into an enterprise. And you find that, you know, those skills and competencies um, are, are, you know, can be somewhat, somewhat novel. Um, shall we say, um, and he, you know this is where you know this is where the whole um, enterprise um, you know computing uh, and and technology challenge you know this is where, this is where the plot thickens because in previous generations of technology and enterprise it was really uh, focused on taking technology deploying it oper operationalizing it within. Uh, the context of the enterprise, which is all well and good, but it was really engineered. The whole um, you know, system and culture was engineered to optimize internal business processes and to optimize the enterprise within the walls of the enterprise. So along comes this digital disruption where customers are now um, expecting to engage with your brand digitally, directly, the whole paradigm shifts. It just simply doesn't work. Um, all of a sudden, you need to be delivering not just utility, but software experiences to customers outside the enterprise. And making you know, the challenge even more difficult is the fact that uh, customers outside the enterprise have very different expectations than the ones inside the enterprise. They want um, high, high quality experiences, they want uh, to uh, have what you deliver them to evolve quickly uh, to meet their evolving needs. And uh, you need to utterly rethink the, the fundamental role that technology itself plays in the scope of the business. Because all of a sudden, you're not just optimizing the business, you're actually driving it. There is. Think about today, uh, when you interact with, with, with any brand. Your expectation is you're able to engage that brand, any brand, any, any uh, industry sector, primarily through digital channels. And herein lies an incredible opportunity. Um, we did a survey of, uh, of the kind of the current state of um, technology and large enterprises. And, um, and this is a recent survey, 80% of technology budgets in the enterprise are spent on maintenance. This is not 
moving the needle forward in the business. This is just keeping the lights on uh, that, you know, to, 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 for, uh, um, for kind of the, the, the back office operations of, of, of the enterprise. Only 10% of the technology managers in the enterprise feel that they're using innovation effectively to drive competitive advantage, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it abysmally low. I mean, they, they know that it's too low. But they're struggling. Um, and I would say that, you know, th kind of through, through my journey, um, you know, talking to enterprises and being in one, uh, I think velocity is you know, one, of the, one of the toughest challenges because there have been, you know, layers and layers of, of, of technology that have accreted uh, over many years uh, to operate in a certain mode. All of a sudden, you're having to deliver software to customers you know, effectively running software as a service operations, and um, you know you can't. You're you're just limited in how quickly you can move. So velocity is an incredibly tough challenge. You need to think about the value of what you're delivering in a completely different way. Because again, um, you're engaging customers um, outside. You know, kind of the safe confines of the enterprise. You know, trust becomes a huge issue. Um, your brand, any enterprise's brand, relies on the trust that they're able to establish and maintain uh, with, with customers. So you look at you know, security breaches that, that, that happen. Um, I won't mention any names, but you know, it, can, it can absolutely destroy, and, and not just trust, but the value of a brand uh, literally overnight. And last but not least, reliability. You know, when, a, when a customer wants to engage with your brand with an app or a website, you know, if, the response time is 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 poor, or they, um, you know, the, there's some some operational issue on the back end. You know, they're they're, you know, they're they're going to be very unhappy customers, uh, very quickly. So they expect, you know, true 24/7 uh, engagement at at a very high level of quality uh, with your brand. So that brings me to just if you want to read more about my thoughts and uh, the kind of the digital transformation of, of enterprise and the challenges and, and the opportunities that uh, it represents. Um, I wrote a short book. It's meant for a, a two or three hour plane ride uh, max and uh, it's, a, it's a free download if you go to uh, ca.com. So with that, um, you know, th this is a framing for, for really thinking about the opportunity uh, in the enterprise, because you know, enterprises are struggling massively through this transformation. Any company uh, who can give them you know, tools or some, some way uh, to navigate from kind of the past state of legacy traditional IT to a new mode of operation where they're engaging customers digitally and delivering value uh, through actually building software experiences um, you know, is, you know, is, has a high likelihood of, of success. So it's a, a huge opportunity. So with that, questions? Yes? Yes, could you uh, talk a little bit about the acquisition of Bungie and the Halo franchise? Did that happen circa 1999? Yeah, so you know, the, the, the ability to um, have exclusive content you know, can you know can really make or break a franchise. Uh, you know, so I think of of you know Halo as a real kingmaker. Uh, but it wasn't just Halo; it was Halo and the combination of Xbox Live that was, I think, you know, transformational for really cementing you know the 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 Xbox brand um, you know on the scene. You know, on they they both have different you know different different challenges. Um, the the um, uh, quality expectations for um, uh, you know live viewing is you know lower uh, typically, um, but you know the, you know CDNs you know largely solve you know address that address that last mile issue. Um, you know, you're, you are able to do, um, 
you know, higher level of, of quality of encoding uh, with non-real life content because you can do multiple passes over the content um, uh, because it's not live and you can take your time uh, uh, to drive higher quality. But I, I, frankly, I don't, there's not um, there's not a huge amount of, of, of difference between um, between the two. Um, so you know some some subtle differences, but um, you know at, at the end of the day, you're still slinging video over the wire. Uh, I think um, you know it's 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 a accretion of technical debt. So you have a over time you build you build up um, a high degree of fragility in in systems. So making a change, uh, even a even a minor change, um, is going to be far more time consuming than it would be if you started from scratch and build something that um, you know that was a had a modern architecture. Um, well, I came across that in, in, in my, you know, work on Windows. Um, there was a, an incredibly great deal of thought that went into the architecture of, of NT, which then became, um, you know, Windows XP, and I mean, it's, the current Windows still has its roots in, in, in that architecture. Uh, so, um, you know, I think I think it's a good example of, of you know a, a very well thought out architecture that wasn't rushed on the front end that had that that really paid dividends um, through the years. Yeah, so you know, I, I think about um, VR really as a as an evolution of um, the massive increases we've seen in um, compute uh, around visualization. You know, so the rise of the GPU um, is really what has made it possible uh, to have uh, VR type experiences where you're you know literally recreating reality. Um, you know, using essentially mathematical processing. Um, so um, it's um, you know the rise of the GPU it, it is interesting because it's it's it spawned you know some some new capabilities, both in visualization and and VR, but also um, today we're seeing it used for um, AI as well. So it's 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 it, it's interesting how. Um, uh, you know, some you know, unintended consequences or unanticipated uh, consequences, uh, you know, can um, can happen. I haven't read your book, but uh, from where you stand as a technologist, this is a very generic question: What really scares you about the future, and what really excites you? That are common, that are not commonly understood, that are outliers sort of out there. You know, I mean, not, uh, the thing that scares me, and I think that scares all, you know all of us, is you know un unintended consequences and the things that we can't see or can't credibly imagine. But that said, um, you know, I'm I'm more of an optimist than a pessimist. You know, I think there's a lot of um, you know positive potential around machine learning and and AI uh, to um, really help us. Um, be better than we are, to be more creative, to, um, to uh, alleviate some of the rote, you know, drudgery that we, we all have to deal with at some level, and let us spend more time and our creative potential on, on things that have more value, frankly. Just a gigantic strategic 
Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, frankly, it, it, it falls into um, perhaps a, a little bit of, of, of carelessness or, or um, uh, you know, the, you know, the lack of, um, uh, you know, oversight uh, or, or around data governance. But, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it, it, it's more around unintended consequences than anything, than anything else, frankly. Um, it's just really, really hard to anticipate how, you know, a system can be, you know, can be used uh, for, for um, you know, bad intent. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the, I think, challenges that, um, you know, technologists have is that we, we tend to think through the lens of positive intent. It's like, hey, I'll build this thing, and it'll be, you know, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be awesome, and it'll be, it'll be used for the, uh, you know, for the purposes intended. And we probably don't spend enough time, you know, thinking about the, the flip side. You know, it's like, you know, how could this be used for, you know, bad intent? Hey, well, thank you very much. <laughs>